<clears throat> Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 192, Uno Nueve Dos. Thank you for joining me once again. As per usual, today is a nice, sunny, wet, wet, wet London morning. If you are under any assumptions that the weather here is great and it's sunny, just like the Caribbean, you have been lied to. It is drab, dreary, wet, muggy, and incredibly humid. So if you're seeing me wiping my brow, trust me, it's because of the humidity, not because of anything else I may have ingested. Strictly because of the humidity and not because I left on the heater for 24 hours. Strictly the humidity. Strictly the humidity. And this building is um, a, a technically a new build because it was built after the year 2000, 2000 right? Which can mean 2001, 2002. But if you look at a video... Always compare technology to music videos. That's what I would do. If you're wondering, oh, is this thing new? Is this thing the latest model? Go and watch a music video from your favorite artist if they were around when they put out music video maybe in 2002 and see what it looked like. And kind of, you know, imagine, you know, look, look, look at the video and then compare it to your reality. And then you'd be like, oh, that's old as fuck. So this building is technically a new building because it was built in 2002. There's actually pictures out there on the interwebs of um, the the queen coming and cutting the ribbon for this building for some reason. I'm not sure why. Maybe it got some sort of royal funding. Maybe one of her, um, one of her, you know, royal um, siblings or children has a house here forever, which would be quite cool, right? Imagine as part of being as being a one of the kids that grow up, grows up in a royal family, you get told at a young age that you have all these amazing flats dotted around uh, dilapidated areas in East London somewhere that you can just go and live in with rent-free, all the electrics always on, it's always paid for year-round, but no one lives there. That would be pretty cool, right? The only problem would be is like, imagine if you're, you know, Queen Victoria went and did that for you in 2002, and, you know, the, the house is full of 2002 furniture. It's not quite avocado uh, bathroom suite, but it's pretty much close enough, right? It's the kind of apartment where you might have carpet in your toilet, right? That kind of apartment. It might be the apartment where you have, like, those old school electric heaters, which I definitely don't have, right? It might be one of those kind of apartments where you have a table um, with, like, I don't know, that has in it or that's like quilted or some shit just really weird fixtures that would be quite weird isn't it if you came back to that well that's what happens here it was built in 2002 the insulation technology wasn't as advanced as it is now so that led to this building being incredibly warm during the summer months any kind of warmth outside any kind of humidity on the outside world immediately cooks this place up like a fucking you know heats this place up nicely like you know you preheat your oven you know you get pizza from the shop and you're like oh just you're really hungry so you don't try and preheat you just chuck it in there and you whack it to 170 um fahrenheit if you're feeling a bit cheeky you whack it up to 200 you're just like fuck it i'm hungry i need to eat then you try and eat it and it comes out and it's the liquid all over the top of it it's all watery the the base is cooked and crispy but the top of it isn't it's really doughy but you're hungry so you just eat it and you shove it down your throat you're like fuck i hope i pray to god that this doesn't kill me but then, you know, the next time around, if you preheat the oven, just 10 minutes. Don't even do it that long. Just 10 minutes. And if you're being feeling a bit cheeky, maybe 15, right? At the highest heat, then you bring it down. So you preheat it to 200. You bring it down to 170, 150. Then you slide that motherfucking pizza in. Guess what pops out the other side? Oh, oh. It might as well be, um, what's, what's that place called? Um, what's, what's, what's it called? Um, it, might as well call, it might as well be a pizza program pizza. Do you know what I mean? It might, as well, it might as well want them pieces. They're the ones that they need, right? And they flip up in the air and stuff, right? The ones that, you know, um, Caucasian um, um, tattooed up guys like to make all the time. So it's that same kind of dude, isn't it? With little tiny hats, white, with loads of fucking shitty tattoos, kneading and doing pieces, right? It's always his dream to watch, do pieces. He watched one Vice video on Munchies and he's like, you know what? That's what I'm missing in my life, pizzas. And he goes out there and makes pizzas and guess what? I'm making jokes about it while this guy's got voodoo rays. Fucking life, right? That's how it starts, isn't it, right? That's how it fucking starts. But yeah, hello, 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 hello! Family and friends, it's I again. It's I, I'm back, I'm back. So I thought I'd squeeze one in now because um, unfortunately the brunette's friends are over so there won't be no time to do many podcasts because, you know, when other people come around your home studio turns into a place to welcoming guests, family and friends, which is annoying because I hate people coming over. I have to be honest. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I kind of like, I like being on my own all the time, right? And when I'm on, no, 
you know what? I like being on my own. And when I'm on my own, I like being on my own. Does that make sense? I want to be on my own. No, but like, you know, when you're at home, you don't, the last thing you want is company, is people. You see that when you go outside, right? On the commute to work, at work, people telling you their inane conversations, what they did on weekend, what their boyfriend's doing, what their girlfriend didn't do, what they're eating for lunch, their holiday. It's the fucking same thing. And that's what package comes in. Everyone has to pretend like it's the first time they've seen one. Oh, Amazon package comes in. What did you get? Does none of your business. It's the same flipping shit, right? All the time. So when you're at home, the one thing I would like to do is just to kind of be on my own. On my own, right? No one near me. Don't touch me. Don't look at me. Don't even breathe my way. Just leave me alone. Don't want any conversation about anything. Don't want to talk about stuff. Don't want to become friends. We are friends already. I'm going to see you on the outside world, right? Let me call you. Let me text you. And I'll meet, have a drink, have some fun. Then I go home. That's it. None of this, like, you know, in my... It's like, um, what's that language they have in the work world? Um, Spaces, right? I don't want you in my space. They have that thing about it, right? The spaces you occupy. I'm occupying my space. Let me have my space, right? That's my space. Not my space, but my space. I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. My space. Space mine. Fuck, man. But it's hard to say, in it? To people like, I don't want people to come around. But it's hard. You can't really say that, can you? You've got to be like, you got to play it. got to play it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah come around. Right, come around. Right. Then you're like, fuck you. Fuck that. Right? These are like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> DJ like no yeah <laughs> that's, oh, that's how you gonna be suddenly like yeah no yeah yeah nothing gonna shake your head at the same time but anyway whatever man <laughs> I wish you know sometimes you wish you could be like you know what's that word what's that book I've got um um no is it radical honesty what's that book there's a book called is it radical honesty there's a guy that did like these these seminars about it and I think Google maybe took a lot of the lessons learned from it and put it into the employee handbook and put it as part of their HR processes. Um, I think it's Radical Honesty. There's a book called Radical Honesty. I'm pretty sure it's that. And it kind of, you know, stiff, it kind of proposes the idea of trying to be as honest as you can in every given situation. And, you know, it kind of expands on the ideas that kind of Jordan Peterson speaks about quite highly about trying to tell the truth, being a truthful person. But this is like Radical Honesty. This is like, you know, letting your you're letting your subordinates or people that you work with know exactly when they're falling short of your standards but also making it known when they meet your standards because we've all been in workplaces in it right where i necessarily you know i always talk about i don't care about workplaces you know i don't for the most part don't give a flying fuck i just do them because you know they allow me to uh, um, keep up my standard of living and pursue my other interests but you do know that you know every place you've been in working wise where it's been really contentious and fractious it's been because for the most part it's because the people that you're working under don't necessarily have that candor with you don't i'm not necessarily honest right some of the, there's a lot of backbiting a lot of snaky moves a lot of um a lot of um purposeful misdirections a lot of ambiguity withholding information loads of really shitty things that don't really you don't really like as a person right um one example could be pay right imagine you're gonna you're all gonna get paid in the company imagine everyone's gonna get paid late cool no worries just let everyone know, isn't it? That's not a bad, bad thing, isn't it? Something stuff happens in businesses, not all the, you know, and things happen. People can people are understanding. Just say, hey guys, we're gonna get paid late this month. We're all getting paid late. Please wait our updates. No problem. But instead, some companies don't do that. They kind of do that thing where you know somebody owes you money. I know I've heard I've heard of this before, right? Where if someone owes you money, especially in America, they do it more. They don't do it here in the UK. But if someone owes you money in America, for some reason, I don't know why, maybe their monetary values or the things that they accept are a little bit different than us here in the Euro- in Europe or the, us here in the UK and maybe in Europe. But it's for some reason people in America accept checks if someone owes more money. Like, oh yeah, take the check. Sorry, man. I'm really sorry about this. So then imagine if someone's owed you a hundred quid or two hundred quid or five hundred quid for ages, five hundred dollars, whatever maybe, you know, fuck it. You just take the check anyway, you, you chuck it into the bank. Usually I think the reason why they do that is because usually the person that lent it to you isn't struggling for money. You're the one struggling for money. That's why you lent it off that person. So they don't, they're not necessarily chasing you back because they desperately need the money to eat. They're chasing you back because it's our principle of like, hey, I lent you that money when you really needed it. Now give it back to me, right? That's how it is. So I think because of that, they play on that kind of naivety or that kind of good grace and they take your, they take the check, put it in the bank. But then, of course, after three days, because what happened, the check bounces because there's nothing on in that account to kind of, you know, take from it. So you would 
so people do that with themselves um, interpersonally right to like uh, and and the reason i've heard people do that is because they're hoping that within those three days they'll be able to raise the money put it into an account so that by the time it clears on your side the money can come through or so by the time your, your bank tries to um credit to your account it will come through but when it comes to pe- working in a working environment there's no real need for that right because we're all working here we know so it affects everybody in the in in the office space it affects me as a it affects this guy as the single dude who skates every weekend and just wants to have the money so he can go for another skate tour with friends. It affects the single mum over there. It affects the married couple. It's like everyone gets gets affected by it. Just tell people, radical honesty. But they don't. They just avoid the information and they keep it strong. So sometimes you would ha- like it if more workplaces, people in general, human beings, friends, were just honest. If anything, thinking about it now, the only people that are really honest with you are your friends, really, aren't they? Sometimes you have that benefit of your parents or your family being quite honest right you grew up in a house where you know your mum doesn't fuck around your dad doesn't fuck around they tell you exactly what they think about you and what you're doing but sometimes people are unlucky where they have um, enablers as parents people that kind of you know uh tell them you know the sun shines out of their ass and stuff that they can do no wrong blah blah blah, blah which really does them a disservice because what ends up happening is that they end up usually looking for friends that exude those same sort of um feelings or opinions about them so they end up surrounding themselves with friends that are quite similar to their mum or dad because they like that kind of person, right? Then they wouldn't necessarily put up with somebody that's going to be telling them how it is or calling them out on their bullshit. So again, it, it, it affects it affects you in weird ways as you as you kind of traverse this crazy thing that we call life. But in, again, in general, I just wish things were a little bit more, you know, a little bit more honest led. It was a little bit more, you know, if things came at you as they were, so you knew where you stood and can go from there really but it doesn't, you know, it's kind of one of those kind of words. It kind of, we live in a world where you have to kind of, you know, there's a lot of nuance. You have to kind of pull the codes out from the mess that's going around you have to kind of figure it out it's a hazy picture you've got to kind of bring it to focus yourself you can't exactly help someone's not going to be like hey by the way that thing over there hasn't been done right you're going to have to find out because you know your boss is giving you the cold shoulder right and you're like hold on why is it being acting so weird and you go, oh yeah shit and then you realize something that you did wrong as opposed to just someone coming up to you and saying hey by the way that 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 wasn't cool wasn't wasn't called for you need to do better or you're gone Oh, no problem, right? Then you know what to do. You, you, you've been given the remit of where you, you've been given. You basically, it's been laid there for you in black and white. You know exactly where you stand. There's no ums and ahs. There's no to and fro. There's no, oh, did I misinterpret that? No, you know exactly where you stand. Then you can decide, do I stay? Do I go? But, you know, what do I know? Anyway, let's get into some topics because we're wasting loads of time. I like saying that, wasting loads of time, like, as if there's a timer here that's making me go and someone's going to chuck me out. There is no timer here. I'm the timer, right? I give time. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Where can I find this? Where can I find this? So, uh, number one topic I want to talk about was this, right? Uh, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, so here. So, this really tweet. this tweet came out the other day. That's had the internet, that's had the Twitter land, Twitter timeline on fire, which I never knew was a term, right? I've only started using Twitter within the last year and a half um, regularly. I've, I've really stopped using Instagram. I disabled it for a while back and then now it's kind of back on. Um, so if you've got to add me on Instagram, please do. I'm there. But for the most part, I kind of make all my social media attention is kind of on Twitter. For the most part, I follow quite, you know, um, newsworthy outlets and people and stuff who kind of you know put out interesting ideas you know no dave rubin but they're you know they're out there doing their thing so my twitter feed isn't really full i don't really get the hot button topics at the moment they don't really slip through my my timeline because i don't really have those kind of people on there that are talking about you know another i don't know college campus um you know um thing that happened or whatever or some other social justice warrior thing it's always kind of you know some good topics talking about what's going on in current culture wholesome things for the most part but this news kind of slipped through that i would maybe count in that kind of realm right a kind of weirdo tweet so um this tweet came in and it's from steve harvey right steve harvey made this um quite bananas statement i think my new steve harvey show i'm not sure if it's new if it's a new tweet, if it's something that is old, whatever it may be, but let me get it up and we'll, we can talk about it. Da, 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 da. Let's get it, let's get it, let's get it. Where is it? What am I looking for? Yeah, cool. There it goes. So notes here, right? So here, rich people don't sleep, according to Steve Harvey. Do, 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 do. Show this on here. My computer is very slow today. There we go. Finally done. Rich people don't sleep eight hours a day, according to Steve Harvey's Sleep V Wealth, right? We're going to break this down a little bit in this video, and we're going to analyze what he's talking about and see if there's any sense to these nonsensical statements from... Um, he's sort of like a faux televangelist, isn't it, really? Isn't it? In a weird way, isn't it? Would you say that? 
he kind of mothers maybe because of the way he looks but it's sort of like in the, that, that kind of way of speaking that pattern um bombastic stuff um everything's about absolutes there is no middle ground that sort of stuff right that thing he did with um monique has always rubbed me up the wrong way sitting down on national tv with your friend and airing out your dirty grievance your grievances in front of the public to watch is a bit weird um it's very hot 97 ish um, you know, putting your friends on blast to get views. Like, I'm not really a fan of that. But again, everyone's got their way of doing things. So Steve Harvey on his show, um, it's a little segment, 30 seconds. We can't read too much into it because there might be there might be a larger context to this. But the internet went in a bit of a firestorm. I kind of released some tweets kind of um, uh, fighting against what he's saying, but also kind of, you know, breaking it down into what, it, what he's basically talking about in general to his audience, I'd assume for the most part. Let's watch a little bit of that. Let's talk in front of me and you can hear what I'm talking a bit. Zoom in a bit here. Boom. People don't see eight hours a day. That's a third of your life. Then for 24 hours in a day. You cannot be sleep eight hours a day. You can't live in LA and wake up at eight o'clock in the morning. It's 11 o'clock on the East Coast. The stock market been open two hours. They already making decisions about your life and your ass was sleep. The Bible says he who loves to sleep. What's that about breach and stuff? I didn't even know he was going to say the Bible stuff. So I forgot. I'm... And the folding of hands, poverty will set upon you like a thief in the night. And again, that quote is taken out of context, isn't it? Because you know what that quote actually means and it? it's about letting life pass you by as opposed to not sleeping i'm pretty sure jesus wasn't a fucking uh self-help guru back in the day right jesus wasn't fucking the first tony robbins out there like this is nuts <laughs> how can you take a scripture out of context like that i'm not even a flipping i don't even go to church anymore right and i know that scripture doesn't mean you shouldn't be sleeping it means don't let life pass you by don't sit idly by whilst opportunities are passing you by go out there and go get it right jesus christ motherfuckers anyway steve harvey says what he says he's got his he's, he's got a right to his opinion and again i think you can take it in twofold you can say number one i'd say categorically he's wrong i don't think sleeping is any kind of indicator or any kind doesn't it doesn't yeah sleeping is, has no indic sleeping uh, sleeping is no indicator of how susceptible or how likely you are to attain wealth or success but then again it's up to you what you want to determine as wealth and success right so if wealth is the name of the game, then potentially what he's saying is correct, right? Because that's what the, there's a little sub, someone put an overlay text over there. I'm not sure if it's, it's actually what he said, but he's, he's, he spoke about the stock market. So let's imagine he's talking about money. If he's talking about generating money, like numbers, right? You want to be Warren Buffett. You want to you wanna be Bill Gates. You want to be Mark Zuckerberg. You want to be Kevin Systrom. You want to be these people that generate money, right? And I'm not sure if Kevin Systrom can count, the Instagram guy. I'm not sure if he set out to just become a billionaire. Or a million, I'm not sure. Again, maybe Mark Zuckerberg is a pretty, a pretty good example. Maybe Kevin Spiegel from Snapchat maybe is a better example. Maybe PD is a better example. Um, those kind of people that set out to, you know, they come from a, they come from a dark, bad place, and you, the primary goal is to kind of get out there in the world and make as much money as you can, so you never have to go back to where you came from, right? Money, 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 because they see money as like the security blanket that's going to make sure all the things that happened to them in the, in the past, whether it was a power going off, whether it was a lack of money, uh, the lack of actually good sleeping um, arrangements, whatever it may be, they won't want to go back there again. Now, if that's true and he's talking about wealth and money alone, then there is maybe some truth to what he's saying because he's talking about stock markets. He's talking about, you know, uh, being up at a crack of dawn so you can conduct your businesses from the West Coast and the East Coast, different time zones. There might be some validity in what he's saying, right? Because you're going to have to be on, especially if you're investing, I'd imagine so. I'd get, I have an invest in the stock market. There might be an occasion where you need to be on call available all the time to kind of get that done but i'm assuming nowadays if you've got the money and the means there are probably brokers that you could use who could do that work for you whilst you sleep you don't necessarily need to be awake to do that yourself but again if you're starting up you don't have that much income then maybe you might have to do all this stuff yourself and really put your nose to the ground now again this is only for the one percent of the one percent of the one percent right not every no one in this not many people in the world there's a reason why there's only a certain number of billionaires and it isn't because of the patriarchy don't believe that nonsense right it's not because of that it's because to attain that level of wealth the work that's needed is something that only a small amount of people are willing to do or can do let's say can do and willing to do is both in the conclusion right i don't necessarily think most of it there might be a percentage of let's say in a percentage of um reason why there might be a certain percentage that you can attribute to systemic um, to systemic oppression, to patriarchy in some way, shape or form. That probably does exist. But I say for the most part, 
the precondition of a person to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, to sit on his computer, invest in stocks that no one's heard of, to worry about this sort of stuff in his lunch break, to be reading investment magazines to on a commute to work, reading that stuff on the way back, doing that again when he comes home from 7 to 1 a.m., then wake up again at 6 a.m., to do that day in, day out, day in, day out with a family, just doing your regular shit in life, day in, day out, seeing no real discernible um, results, no real um, actionable things. I said, oh, look, I'm really good at this. It's not coming yet. It's not coming, not coming. And boom, all of a sudden it comes and you become, you know, one of the richest men in the world. And I think that level of suffering, I mean, only a certain number of people can do it. In the same way, you know, these 100 mile races that you see people doing now, supposedly they're, they're thinking about doing 500 mile races, I heard in Joe Rogan podcast. Like, yeah, and then they want to do it maybe 750, 750 miles of running, right? And, that's, and I said that, right? People are trying to run 750 miles. Right. There is something there is a there is a mental makeup of that person that not everyone has. There is your wires are a bit your wires are your wires are put together differently than other people. That's something that you just can't deny. I'm sorry. There's nothing there's no amount of um there's no amount of even in a playing field that's going to make the regular person around the corner want to do that. Or even if that imagine that's not even the case. Imagine if it, imagine if it was the case that there was a lot of money in marathon running, right? And like there was a lot of money in that kind of three five hundred mile races, there still wouldn't be that many people doing it. If if imagine first place got you a million dollars every single time, there wouldn't be that many people signing up. Because again, it takes a certain person to want to do the training, to sign up, to commit to it, to put the deposit, whatever it may be, to fly to that place where you have to go train. It's a certain person that does that to tape your feet up and keep running. There's a you have to be a little bit mentally. Same with wealth. I think there's you know. We've all seen it with people like Jeff's up, Jeff Jeff Bezos, sorry. Do you know, like he's worth more than anyone in the world today, and he's still driving. He's still going for. He's still he's trying to take um he's trying to um, launch uh rocket ships and stuff, right? Spaceships. He's trying to go into the he's trying to he's trying to land on the moon. So these guys just have there's something else about them wired. Now that's wealth, by the way. When it comes to success, or when it comes to maybe achieving your dreams, that's different, right? I don't think wealth and success in that way are, diff- are different, are the same because success in that way could be you being a sneakerhead and having the opportunity to um, make a living reviewing trainers on YouTube. It, won't, it might not necessarily generate you millions and millions of dollars, but it will allow you a lifestyle where you do everything at home. You don't have to go to a workplace. You get given shoes by certain companies to review. You've got adoring fans. You give back to the community that made so much to you that it's very fulfilling, right? It might not be as much money as somebody working in a marketing department of a sneaker company, but for you, you'd much rather be making your own content under your own rules, in your own house, in your own studio, with your friends, promoting things you love than working for a brand that you don't love but take home $100,000 a year instead of taking home $50,000 on YouTube and doing the thing you love. And you hear that stuff said a lot about someone like Gary Vee, right? He's always talking about those kind of things. So I think you have to split the both of those things. And I think one thing you probably can't have that much sleep. You have to be, you have to acknowledge that if you want to be Mark Zuckerberg, you have to be, if you want to be the best of all time, if you want to be go down in history as one of the people that really shook up the world, that left their imprint on society, that contributed to, to the furtherment of the political conversation, to humanity in general. If you want to go down in flipping history, I'm sorry, but you can't sleep eight hours a day. It's just like, no one's done it so far. No one's been able to, um, no one that we know of goes to Coachella, um, attends all the gigs, goes out, drinks, does drugs, plays football on the weekends, goes goes on dates on Tinder, and still runs a billion dollar company. It doesn't exist, right? It doesn't really exist. Always oh, trying to get a billion, run a billion dollar company. That's not a thing that ha- exists at the moment. We don't have any examples of it. So for now, what we can ascertain is that if you want to be the best of all time, you have to sacrifice sleep. And, sac- and not only sleep, you have to sacrifice going out, sacrifice family, sacrifice friends to get to where you need to get to. Imagine the amount of birthday parties, anniversaries, funerals um, you have to miss. Just imagine, not including all the stuff with your partner, Valentine's and relationship uh, milestones, all that stuff. Imagine, forget all that stuff in your partner's birthday. Imagine just those things that you're going to have to miss, you're going to feel really good about, especially if you're really close to your family and friends. That's to achieve all-time greatness. But if you want to achieve success, then of course you can sleep eight hours a day. But then the whole thing that really underpins it or kind of really does away with this whole idea is this really weird uh, fetishization of rich people not of being rich people being abnormal, of being freaks, right? People that are rich are freaky, 
Um, they have like weird things they do in order to get their money. And I think that's where we get as a society or in general, maybe it's the, again, I'm having done a podcast and trying to ascertain some real life lessons that can be gleaned from, you know, topical things happen to celebrities instead of just looking at them as like freaks of nature. I think what I've seen in general is that there's a lack of um, humanity or there's a lack of common sense reasoning or rationality being placed in some of the things that people say, right? Also, if you think people do or the way they conduct themselves, like Steve Harvey's a great dude. He's done a lot of great stuff. He's got his own production company. He's got a hit TV show. He's, you know, he's kind of a staple in American culture. Great. But I think he's starting to believe he's on hype, right? You're starting to believe that you are other, you are different than other people. You might be hardworking. You might have a really good drive. You might have talent and tenacity. You might have all those things might have convoluted into the perfect timing of you meeting this person and it all lined up. Cool. But you're not a freak. Right, what you have done has been done before and will be done again in the future. It's something that can be repeated quite easily. His level, especially his level of success, right? It's not something that's really crazy abnormal. Um, so what he's saying is a bit weird because essentially he's trying to make it seem as if like he's got this special cheat code that's allowing him to do the success that he's done. And I'm telling you right now, if you try and sleep less than eight hours and you can't sleep less than eight hours, you'll be in for a rude awakening. Not not a lot of people can do that. Right, even go, going back to when you were in school, there were some people that could cram. Remember that thing, cram before an exam? And there were some people like myself who couldn't. If I cram, I'd completely flop in the exam because I have too much information in my head and I didn't know where to start or begin. What I had to do was plan ahead of time, one to two months, maybe even three months, and actually work diligently half an hour to an hour every single day, Monday to, no, sorry, Monday to Friday. And that's when I felt a bit more comfortable. But if I went into an exam with a couple of nights worth of cramming or an evening worth of cramming, I would die. It would, it didn't work for me. So we're different. Everyone's made up differently. So some people can operate on four or six hours of sleep. Some people can't. And some people just have to operate on that kind of level of sleep because the level of celebrity that he is, the amount of business that he must run, the amount of production companies he's set up, the amount of things he's involved in, he might have to wake up at those times just to kind of get business done, right? If he's saying you wake up at eight and it's 11 on the East Coast, he might have to just get up at six just for business sense so that he's up when those he's up when those guys are getting to the office that might just be one of those things it might not be a talent or like a special thing that he's commonly been adorned or blessed with it just might be the circumstances he's in but i also think in general we don't what we need to kind of say to people or people need to say to themselves or really question themselves is what gary v spoke about a lot it's not about what you do when you're sleeping it's not about how long you're sleeping it's about what you're doing when you're waking up or when you're awake right that's what you should be concentrating on so for everyone out there complaining about what they don't have, blah, 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 think about the times that you spend procrastinating, wasting time on social media, watching stuff on Netflix, watching a random YouTube video. Those are the hours of the day that you need to commit to all the things that you want to do in order to kind of better yourself. Or if you do want to become a 1%, that's the things that you want to kind of concentrate on. So 1% is what they probably are doing is limiting the amount of time they're sleeping to wake up before they go to work to get to work doing the things they want to do. So I'd imagine if you're a 1% to 1%, it probably isn't, crazy to you to sleep for six hours five hours four hours get up in the morning 5 a.m go for a run because it, it, it makes you uh come alive or be awake maybe do some push-ups or sit-ups whatever it may be something they do in the morning to kind of get them ready and start going come back in shower and then from the hours of six to eight or six to nine before you get the, you head out to work you work on your craft that you want to do whether it's programming whether it's making a website whether it's building an app whether it's um getting your agency or your service up and running you spend those hours in the morning before you've even gone to work working on your stuff that you want to do outside of work at lunchtime you're probably doing it too on the way back home you're probably doing it too from 7 to 1 a.m you're probably doing that too that's what one percent is probably do right that's the, and again that's something that everyone can do fine but to live a successful life a life full of fulfillment something that you get you got you know to have to feel like you've got a, a reason for waking up reviewing trainers um is a good example right you sleep eight hours a day you wake up in the morning get to work you've got the whole day ahead of you get the work done in the morning so then in the afternoon you have free to do whatever you want to do but what will end up happening is that if you build good habits and you start reviewing your shoes early or start thinking about ideas uh thinking of shot ideas thinking of where you're going to put it what lighting what the title you're going to use what tags you're thinking about the cover art the thumbnail sorry you're thinking about all these things in the morning and you're jotting it down you start filming you film some stuff sometimes it doesn't work out you edit it da, 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 da. by the time it comes to maybe 2 p.m in the afternoon then maybe when you start when doing your free time downtime but what end up happening but because you built such a good habit after the 2 a.m after when 2 a.m does come around you probably will just continue working because you're you're doing what 
You do something that you love. There won't be a need for an escape. There won't be a need for like to go somewhere else and unwind. Because you're unwinding, doing something that is making you come alive. So that kind of success, you probably don't need that kind of level of wealth. You don't need to be, you know, um, sleeping four hours a day and waking up at the dusk of dawn to get on the stock market. That's not how things go. And then especially in this era, to become rich or to become wealthy in some, maybe even wealthy is a, maybe wealth is more generational, but to become rich, you don't need to be waking up at the break of dawn to, uh, to see a stock market is open. If you make a product that people want and you sell it online and you you know you have the right marketing spend, the right ads in the right places, you could easily make that money from just from the comfort of your own bedroom. You know you can you can probably make that money whilst you're asleep selling stuff online, fulfilled by Amazon, stuff on eBay, Depop, whatever Facebook Marketplace. You can make a lot of money doing that. You don't need to be awake at a crack of dawn to get into investments. Like, and not everyone understands being a stock market, but people do know products. They know what works. There might be something that you bought recently that you think is amazing that you've been utilizing about your, to your friends too. Why not buy a few of them? Buy a few of them and sell them on to your friends. Sell them on to people in and around your area. Then when it starts blowing up, maybe buy a domain. Uh, get a big cartel shop, get a Shopify account, start selling on there. So yeah, I, I think it's a really weird thing to say as somebody, but again, I think it might just be because you're starting to, you know, you're starting to think his shit doesn't stink and stuff. You don't have to believe your own hype, but again, it's different. I guess if you want to be a, a one percenter, you want to be like Mark Zuckerberg, you're going to be like Jeff Bezos, you want to be like Elon Musk, there is a portion of you that has to understand that you're going to have to sacrifice sleep. I think Elon Musk suffered from this, right? There's a lot of media backlash when he wasn't meeting, a, he was at risk of not meeting the deadlines for the Model 3 and you're sleeping in his office or on his couch. Um, yeah, on the, in the, on the couch of his office to make sure things were running like the way it needs to be run. People are like, oh, these promoting. Um, and then I think a lot of people at the factory too were also willing to do it because they saw the head guy doing it. Uh, they went to sacrifice um, their family life and sleep in, your, in the factory too. They're saying, oh, he's promoting... Um, you know, this idea that you have to sleep at work or you have to kind of work all hours a day in order to kind of get far or whatever it may be. It's like, no, he's showing you that at that level or what they're doing at Tesla Motors, right? How they're trying to absolutely change an industry that is, you know, super resistant to change. I think Elon Musk mentioned in another interview with Joe Rogan that, you know, the auto industry was super resistant, super hesitant on passing the law for mandatory seatbelts in cars, right? Seatbelts in cars, not even airbags, seatbelts. Airbags, maybe they could have argued with, maybe saying, you know, you might end up suffocating yourself, you know, slapping your face on the, on a, on a pillow as you rear rear in into a car. But seatbelts, they were hesitant on having in cars seatbelts. And if you know anything about old school cars, you know most of them don't have seatbelts, right? You're sliding all along in, on the inside, and they somehow thought that would be a good idea. So he's trying to change the whole industry. So I think trying to change the entire industry, right? And then trying to change it to a renewable energy source in terms of electricity, electric cars, right? EVs, electric vehicles. And the way people look at that and the kind of poo-pooing nature that people have about those kind of things, they call it maybe pseudoscience. They, you know, so it will move for some people. It's maybe in a realm of global warming. To do that, you probably do need to sacrifice some levels of sleep. If you just want to, you know, be successful, be able to go on holiday four times a year, take your kids to see movies when they want, Buy them the toys that they like. Buy yourself a nice jacket when the other one rips. You don't need to be up at the crack of dawn. Um, so stock markets to get up. You, you know, again, it's not for everybody. Not everyone can do that. But you, what you, what you should be concentrating on is what you do when you're awake. What's, what's, the, how's your day work out? How are you breaking down the time? Are you spending too much time on frivolous activities? Are you not focusing on the things you need to focus on? That's how you get forward. Again, only in my opinion. What so? What do I know? Let's jump on to something else. Um, here we have here. Non-essential purchases. So it's another interesting tweet from USA Today um, that had the timeline popping. I thought I'd share with you guys today. USA Today, I'll share with you guys today. Oh. So this is um, a tweet from USA Today and it says the following. The average adult in the USA spends $1,497 a month on non-essential items. I'd assume probably might be the same in the UK. All told, that's roughly $18,000 a year on things we can all do without. That's in their opinion, again, because, you know, I'm sure we can all we can all say what... We can all uh, make a uh, conclusion. We can all maybe make a conclusion on what we think is essential, right? So, here's a list of stuff. Average American spends almost $18,000 a year on non-essentials, and they count as f follows, right? Uh, per month, restaurant and restaurant meals two hundred dollars a month, right? Drinks two hundred dollars, takeout one hundred seventy eight, um, buying lunch one seventy four, impulse purchases one hundred nine, ride shares ninety six, grooming ninety four, subscription box ninety four, cable ninety one, online shopping. Okay, cool. Average family, right? Now I would say, 
Again, if you're just a regular dude, regular working class guy, just trying to make a good living and doing yourself, I don't think none of these are non-essential, right? They're all parts of our... Uh, they're all parts of life that make, I think, life more meaningful, right? They add more value to life. I've always said to my little brothers, whenever they were working in a job that they hated, I always told them the one thing that you should be doing, especially working in a job that you don't like, is of course stick it out, right? Because obviously you need the money. Um, but for the most part, try and take, try and spend... For each paycheck, you, for every time you get paid a month, right? Each time you get paid the month, try and buy something nice for yourself. Whether it's a jacket, whether it's a pair of trainers, whether it's treating yourself to a night out, whether it's um, going to the cinema, whatever it may be, do something nice for yourself every time you get paid. Every time. And then what will end up happening is that over the period of time, you'll start to have something to look forward to, right? So that will make whatever you're doing have a meaning. It'll make all the shitty things that are going on day to day a bit more a bit more tolerable. You'll be able to put up with it a bit more. But when you turn up to work every single day, hating what you're doing, with no end in sight, you're just saving money for no no apparent reason, or you're not saving, you're just spending it whenever you're spending it, living life frivolously and not really having no regard for anything, living paycheck to paycheck, that's when life becomes a bit harder. That's when that's when that's when these non-essential items be, you know start to like hurt you. So like, oh, fucking no, I'm not earning enough because every time things are not looking well. But I think in general, for the most part, all these items are central. I think ride shares being one of them. I think to compare sharing to to compare using an, to compare spending a hundred dollars, let's say equivalent to a hundred pound a month on Uber, um, and ensuring that you know you're not killing your fellow um, road users by driving home drunk or inebriated or high. It's something that you can't really put value on. I'd hate to. F- I wonder if anyone can even tally up the results of or how. I wonder what the decrease is in the actual um, drunk driving offences in the UK or just general accidents in general for people. Well, accidents might have probably gone up because people are on their smartphones, Snapchatting all that shit. But but I think driving your car, but I think people that are, people being caught drunk driving has probably decreased a lot since the advent of Lyft and Uber and all these kind of things. It must have. So for somebody to spend a hundred dollars a month, just to get from A to B, sometimes on emergency, sometimes because you have to commute. I think that's cool, man. And you're not buying, you're not owning your own car. You don't have to have that. And you don't have that um, thing sucking on your bank account, right? Even if you're leasing it or if you want to pay outright, again, paying it outright, it's not money up front. You have to pay. Leasing it a month, again, is an exorbitant rate. You're not going to find anything decent for maybe under, for under 300 pounds for the most part a month. It's probably worth it. Personal grooming again, more than worth it. Subscription boxes again, they're probably going to be things that you're you are getting a lot of benefits from. Cable, you probably could probably do without that. You could probably just get um, a Netflix account. I know I have done done that. I don't have a, a TV in my household at all, so I just have everything on the streaming platform for the most part that I get online. Online shopping again, I don't know what that constitutes, but if it's stuff on Amazon, then that might be just about what I spend on books alone. Because I buy about four books a month, so that might be again something that I I, I would say is an essential part of uh, my day to day. And then what else you'd say here? Restaurant meals, I I do about that completely. I don't go out to eat at all for the most part. I'm quite healthy with my eating. I make my own lunches and stuff, so that's something that I save a lot of money on straight away. Uh, drinks, that's something I do when I go out, but I don't. I wouldn't say I spend as much as that. But let's say I do. Let's say that's honest. Takeouts and delivery. Probably not as much as that either. Uh, buying lunch, I don't do that at all. And impulse purchases don't really happen. So I think for the most part, you can make a case for every single one of them. Now, going back to the point previously, the Steve Harvey thing, if you're trying to make your own business, if you're trying to create your own agency, if you're trying to invest in your own startup, if you want to be an influencer, all that sort of stuff, you might have to sacrifice loads of those things and funnel that money all into your passion project. That's the difference, maybe it comes in it. But I don't think these are non-essential items. These are again, it depends. If you live in London, a ride share isn't non-essential. It's essential if you want to get somewhere quickly and you don't have your own car, especially because most Londoners don't even have driving licenses, let alone a provisional, let alone um, have passed their theory. People have like me, I have nothing, nothing, no driver license at all. So the fact that I would, the assumption that I would, um, is somehow non-essential. I can cut back on ride share. It's like nah, that's an essential part of my monthly spend, mate. I need to be able to call an Uber for myself. Like, it has to be. Like, that's not that's not negotiable at all. But yeah, I thought that was quite ridiculous for the most part. I think some of the comments have kind of said the same sort of thing. Again, I'm not sure why they're trying to shame the American public into thinking, oh, you spend £80,000 just to live. It's like, yeah, motherfucker. That's why you need... To, that's, that's why the... What do you call it? The medium or the average cost of employment 
or like you know the hourly rate needs to go needs to kind of go up a bit because this is what i'm spending right if you're the average working class dude that doesn't really care about starting their own business this is what you're going to fight for so yeah i thought that was interesting number two beard weaves man oh my god beard weaves i think i've seen it all right i think i've seen it all i've seen that i've seen those adverts with guys online let me try and get this and stop this first before it plays always always all playing in it boom did i catch it no i didn't catch it um, anyway so there's always i've seen those videos of uh people online doing those um those hair weave things you've seen that right a lot of it's happening i think um the, a, a big proponent of that is little b the rapper he suddenly out of nowhere you know had a, a flipping full head of dreadlocks which you know again if you know if you're a fan of little b you know that mm, that's a bit fishy mate that ain't true i think little dirk might have done the same thing i think the other guy um what's his what's the new artist called a new rapper little something oh i'm saying little something like that little got it little got it right um that kid he's definitely got fake weaves he didn't have dreads before all of a sudden he's suddenly got a full head of dreads so this is something again i think it's a generally american thing i don't think english dudes british dudes care or british black guys for the most part would go to this extent to do this i think you'd get laughed out of the shop i don't know why it is <sighs> i don't know what it is about <laughs> black american men that will go this far for and it's weird it's weird because the same dudes that will get a fake head get a fake head of dreadlocks right are probably the same kind of guys who will really take the piss out of someone a fellow guy if he went and got fake abs or fake pecs but there's no difference right why like there is no discernible difference if you're willing to do that why is that now some why is getting a fake abs now suddenly the craziest thing they're both crazy if you don't have a beard that looks like James Harden, I'm sorry, your beard just doesn't grow that way. I'm not comp my my beard doesn't grow that way either. I just I just rock what I have. Like I don't know what what else can you do there? It's just really preposterous, man. It's just like really a fake beard, huh? But anyway, let's play, play the video and you can see what I mean. Bearded weave, <laughs> dudes are really out here getting this. Hi y'all, this nigga here looking like Project Fat. I mean, <laughs> boom, boom, chicken. <laughs> For glue the weave on top. Mama mia. That is mad, bro. Yo. Oh my god. Fellas, if you gotta go out here and get this, we don't need. With yeah, you just gotta stop, man. You just gotta stop. Like a oh my god! Look at this shit. This shit nice though, Look, I was gonna say it looks incredible. I'm not gonna lie, it looks quite nice. Oh, Again, no, <sighs> I don't know what this was coming to, man. I don't know. I've always wondered, actually, whenever I think, when, especially when the Kylie Jenner, um generation of women were coming into prominence and that sort of look that kind of like weird hourglass look that all the la or the girls of a certain precolition the girls of a certain scene in la have that kind of they you know that that, that instagram look all the girls on instagram they look the same right it's a very shiny flat curvy look right it's all kind of everything's flat the stomach is very tall the face is very flat in some respects or shiny the hair is really bright or slicked back nails done like everything is a, everything's done a certain way they've always got they've all got a certain sort of image and i remember seeing that and thinking you know especially during the time when everyone was to post pictures of kylie throughout the years you know because she's fairly young so people have pictures of her when she was a, a teenager on the on the on their reality tv show and as she was growing up you know the changes in her appearance some of it due to puberty some of it due to you know some other enhancements but i remember when people are freaking out about how different she looked when the ages when they have the it lined up i remember thinking to myself like Without, you know, putting my own personal opinions to one side, right? The fact that maybe I don't agree with, you know, surgically changing yourself in order for you to feel more pretty. I don't necessarily agree with that concept. But again, if it works for you and you feel better about yourself, then you know who am I to judge? Especially if you've shown no signs of mental retardation or you've shown no sense of, you've shown no signs of, you know, being a little bit disturbed or not being all there in the head, then I guess, you know, you're well within your rights to do whatever you want with your body. Free agency. Go do you. But I was also thinking of it looking at it, I was like, you know what? It, 
that's a really good job. Taking away my own personal opinions, they did a really good job, right? If they did a really good job, and I'm saying as a dude, how how long would it or how long would it take, or what would that what excuse would I need to do it myself? Because guys are strange at that, right? Guys, again, this guy's getting ridiculed by me. I'm not gonna, yeah. If you glue a beard onto your face, we can't be friends, right? We just can't. I can't hang out with you, right? If we glue a bit so i just can't hang out with you same way if we go to a restaurant and you start bickering and arguing about you know that you only ordered two starters and a drink i can't be friends with you same way if you kind of glue a beard to your face we can't be friends same way if i if i if you lend me a game and i don't call you but and i don't harass you for it but you just give it to me when you're done with it same way if you lend me a game and you start texting me every two days about giving it back to you we can't be friends there's certain things just like you know there's certain person that you just can't get along with right because sort of the guy who when his team's losing takes the ball and goes home i can't be friends with you even if you got the ball i can't be friends with you um so even though i'm laughing at him and i'm taking i'm ridicule the decision to do that there are some dudes out there that do the same thing but also secretly be like i kind of want that done you know Right, there's guys out there that have that kind of thinking. Cool. If that's the case and you want to get it done, <sighs> what's the problem? Right, it's for you and you alone. You know you're doing it for a particular kind of look. It's gonna serve its purpose, especially if you're gonna. I see. It, maybe it makes more sense if you're gonna go on a holiday. Right, you're going abroad somewhere. You got a special occasion happening or whatever it may be they might make sense because i think maybe just turning up all of a sudden with your friends who normally see you with a goatee all of a sudden you've got like a full james harden it might be a bit strange maybe for an event or maybe going somewhere where not you know people don't know who you are that might work or just in general day-to-day life fuck it if you don't you know if you don't care um girls come back to their hometown with a you know with an entire different body and no one no one's seen them run down the street that you know no one bats an eyelid so i don't think anyone bat an eyelid about you having a beard right it might be a bit weird but people get used to it it's sort of like seeing your eccentric friend in their, in their new outfit all of a sudden, right? It might be strange seeing your friend, you know, wearing no no boxes walking down the street. But after a while, your eyes get used to it, especially if you don't look down. So I get it. But I think it's going to take a lot for dudes. Again, I I don't know maybe something for my own opinion, but I think it's going to take a lot for this kind of trend to kind of be widespread. But it's also, again, very fascinating how the lengths that some American do, again, I think it's America, I'm pretty sure it is, the lengths some American dudes will go to in order to kind of, you know, keep up appearances. But then they'll kind of slate guys on this side of the pool who are a little bit, I don't know, I'd, I'd imagine some of the guys that are on like Geordie Shore and shit who are, incredibly effeminate in some ways but also alpha would get ridiculed by some of the american jock kind of dudes right but they're probably the same kind of characters just expressed different ways right they're both jocks in the same kind of um, way really they've got probably a lot more in common than they have um not in common but bloody hell man beard, gluing a bit gluing a beard to your face is like a next level next level that that's something i didn't think i'd see but again, I'm not surprised because I just think if the girls can get to a level where people are having debates as to whose body is real or not, it's gotten that good, right? I think there is an opportunity for someone to step in and deliver that same level of product to men, especially men who don't want to surgically change their face or anything, right? I think the moment, imagine, because this guy looks like, you know, he's maybe a, bit, a little bit overweight, but if you're, I'd, I'd think, <laughs> could you get to a point where they could maybe lipo your face or, or change your face so you get cheekbones or shit if you're a dude and you want to look ripped? that kind of ripped kind of like jack youtube dude right with a big chin or maybe yeah chins and stuff that would be the weird thing because girls get some stuff sawed down right so they can face can look more uh it can look smaller a little bit more rounder right because that's the idea of cuteness would there be an occasion where a dude will get his jaw broken on purpose and then get something put in place where he's got so you can get like a johnny bravo sort of like massive jawline that's when it's going to reach peak, 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 peak um, self-development kind of plastic surgery level ways. Imagine that. That's going to be nuts. People just getting that, you know. Then, then stuffing stuff in your stomach to make you look like your abs won't seem that big of a deal, really. Think about it. If someone's willing to fucking get their, their jaw broken and have some sort of metal structure thing be important. Or maybe just a whole thing reconstructed. And so they can make you look like you're, you've got like a bigger face. Sucking the fat out of your face. Make you look like you have cheekbones, like you've lost weight. Wow. But again, not for me, man. Not for me. I'd much rather have a shitty beard. Like, I, I do the same thing with the hair. I, I'm kind of blessed where I don't really have any... Doesn't really ha- I don't have an indication I'll, I'll be bald anywhere. I don't really have any bald spots or my hairline hasn't receded over the, over the years. 
I just have loads of grey hairs for the most part. But I've even said to myself, if I had any kind of balding anywhere and my hair wasn't growing where I needed to grow, I just look like, you know, I look like Lucas Mora. I just leave it like that. I wouldn't go and get a full David Silva and get an entirely different barnet. I just leave it bald. Um, I think a lot a lot of dudes are probably in that kind of realm, but in that kind of think the same way I am. But there might be a, some dudes out there who are like, you know what? I've got a couple bags left. Why not? So more power to you if you want to do that, but not for me, man. Bloody hell. Not for me. What else is on this list here? Let's move on in. Oh, always get this up by accident. Anyway, let's move on up. What else is here? Ba, 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 ba. We saw the Met, Met, Met Gala after party. Didn't we? we see that already, right? Didn't we? Yep, yep, yep. Oh, this is a quite a funny video. This lady has a real problem with Virgil. And I thought this was funny. Let me put this up for you here. We've been speaking about Virgil a lot lately on here, isn't it? Like it's been like three days a week, man. I need to kind of calm down with the fucking Virgil commentary. But I thought this was really funny. Um, she made this entire video talking about how Virgil is is like basically an enemy of black people. He's not an ally. There's loads of real interesting work speak hey, I've been guys, exposed to. So let me pause this. Someone, it's just loads of really cool, interesting work speak I've been I've been kind of um. I've come into contact with ever since I've kind of been following this story regarding Virgil's supposed lack of diversity and I thought it was very very interesting now again I'm not too sure where it's, where it's all coming from I'm not sure if it's because it's a reaction to to what Kanye has been doing and because Virgil is basically you know very close associated with Kanye kind of got his come up his success is kind of you know primarily based on those two guys coming up and doing what they did with uh, Kanye's career and the other stuff that came after it I'm not sure if it's because of that I'm not sure if it's because of the fact that he doesn't up again, like I said in the previous podcast, is because he doesn't really, you know, navigate himself. He's not really in black space, the common blank space. I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't go to Rock Nation brunch and stuff. He's not at, I don't know, Governor's Ball. Maybe, I don't know if it's, that has to do with it, but it just seems strange that he was the one that he went to go and attack. Because it's, because anyway, because if you, if you're aware or if you're in, or if you're, or if you're aware of what's going on in current society with cancel culture, you would know that there's certain patterns of how they attack, right? They choose certain people and they just, you know, they don't stop until the person's kind of bleeding out. Um, and then they kind of reset and then go for somebody else. But they usually use the, usually for the purpose of setting an example for others not to fall out of line or to kind of adhere to what they want. That's why some people um, would argue that you should never apologize. You should never explain yourself because they're they're never going to, it's never going to be enough. They're just going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming. So I don't know sure exactly what the reason is again, but you know, that, that he put up a story on Instagram story of of him having a really late Christmas party for his team. He's a white team based in Milan. I'm sure some of the new guys group people were there too. So all the family love doing their own thing, celebrating everyone in there, showing them love on Instagram stories, tagging a couple of people, um, giving them loads of love, saying that they're the best design, they're the most talented kids ever worked with. And somehow people saw that one thing that he did, that one occasion, the one occasion, this whole time he's been designing clothes, he's been front row, he's been standing next to this model, standing next to that model. The one time he 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 posted this on his Instagram story, they started to label him as you know, an Uncle Tom or somebody that doesn't hire black people. And of course, you know, if you know anything about Virgil, you know, it's quite, quite the contrary. So um, this video from a young lady who kind of, you know, went on a bit of a uh, Black Lives Matter rant regarding it was quite hilarious, really. And again, but I like listening to sort of stuff because it kind of gives you a window into what the other side thinks, right? The kind of fanatical um, absolutist who kind of, you know, decide to become the moral or societal police for everyone right they want everyone to do to do things the way they they want it to be done as opposed to just looking at the way the world is knowing that there might be some fucked up characters and then trying to better it by doing something themselves that's how you that's why it should be right but it's not unfortunately so let's hear what this lady has to say Hey you guys, someone sent me this story regarding fashion designer Virgil Abloh and he posted this very controversial picture of his staff or his fashion brand Off-White and a lot of people were side Why is that controversial? That's the people that work for your company, that's your staff members, why is that controversial? Okay, it's controversial because they're all white. Cool, 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 cool. So what? So what? So what? There's a lot of context to it. There's a lot of nuance to it. But even explaining it seems a little bit redundant because you're never going to never gonna appease people that have that kind of thinking. But let's take a stab at the dark fruit, right? Let's assume Milan isn't as racially diverse as most places. Let's assume as most cities in the world. Let's, you, know, you only have to look at, I don't know, 
do you know a football player called Moses Keane? Cool. Plays one of the biggest one of the biggest clubs in Italy, if not in Europe. Juventus. Cool. One of their star prospects. Cool. Comes up from the youth rank. Cool. Born in it born in Italy. Cool. From Ivorian parents. Cool. But it's essentially Italian to the fucking core. Cool. He probably hasn't even been back to Ivory Coast unless unless he goes back there with his family. But for the most part, you know, second generation immigrants, your parents want you to fucking um assimilate, soak in the culture, and you don't even speak English at home. Or whatever uh, you don't speak your mother tongue language at home for the most that's how it usually is for the most clubs, yeah, because they really want to give you every opportunity for you to succeed. So you do that. You're Moses Keen, you're smashing it, you're 18, 19, you're coming up through the youth ranks, and suddenly you burst through the scenes, you take the mantle as the main guy in the event side, struggling for goals up front. You from the most experienced, you know, maybe you take us you take the slot of an experienced striker in Mandzukic and you start firing in the goals, helping out Cristiano Ronaldo, one of your marquee signings. And guess what happens? Because you play so well and because you're smashing teams and you're young and you're quick and you're fast and you're, you've got great finishing ability, opposing fans start making monkey noise in the stadiums. This is Italy. Italy, this is happening. In 2019, right? One of their star players is getting booed, is getting made monkey noises of, they're chucking bananas on the pitch, whatever it may be, like insulting you on social media. This is happening in Italy now, right? So this place we're talking about, Italy, maybe isn't the most, you know, Woke place in the world, but they're getting there, right? Every place has their problems, you know. But again, it's the it's the idea that somehow we know better, right? And we're gonna try and force these kind of, you know, um, what are they called? Blah, blah, blah. These trendy new ways of doing things in other places that are probably not ready for it just yet. They have a lot more. They have more. Italy has a lot of other things to get um, to sort out and figure out before they address systemic racism. Before they address. Um, patriarchy before they address overt misogyny they have loads of other issues they have to fucking those are pretty big issues they have to address before they get to you know ensuring that a fashion company based in milan is going to somehow argue is going to you know make sure they hire a particular quota of, of people in their in their um in their companies isn't there an issue isn't it isn't it hasn't it been said for most part in um in fashion circles, that Milan Fashion Week is one of the bore is one of the most boring fashion weeks out there. Don't people say that a lot? Don't a lot of fashion editors bemoan the lack of talent coming out of Milan? Why is that? Why do you think that is? Why do you think the most talented kids in Milan are moving to other countries to maybe get a little bit more culturally diverse? Because there's nothing there. So the p the kids that are left there, it's no it's, it's not it's no um it's no um it's no shock that they'll look a certain way. It's no shock they'll come from a certain background. And also, it's Milan. The heartbeat of fashion, or well, well, for them anyway, it's the heartbeat of fashion, right? That's where fashion lives for them. There's maybe plants and manufacturing places there that have been there for years, decades, right? Wouldn't it be a certain type of person that would work in those kind of places, right? That maybe been again, fashion's a small place that get passed around from company to company that works around in different sort of industries. Like they think this isn't controversial. Everything has its context. Now, if this was LA, maybe if this was New York. Maybe you have an issue, but again, it's there is no issue to it. If this my um, why am I not allowed to hire? I want to hire. Do I have to hire again? Even speaking as a, as a, as a black man myself, speaking as a creative myself, right? Again, I'm not I'm not gonna flip in, in um, put myself under a collective banner of like black. Speak for all black men, but you know, speaking of somebody who comes from a background that isn't indigenous to the country I live in, I'm not necessarily only gonna hire people that look like me. I'm just gonna hire the best person for the job. I might have a precolition, a pre precolition of looking out for people that look like me, but it's tough to be able to do the job. That's that's all you can hope to do. Because at the end of the day, who's going to suffer when this business doesn't work out because you decided to hire your friends, people who look like you, people who support the same football team as you, people who wake up the same time as you? What's going to end up happening? Your business ain't going to be able to run anymore. No one that's black in the picture at all. It was just completely white. And this person sent me more information on him, and everything makes sense now for why his staff is completely white. So if you're interested in learning why he has no black fashion designers on his team, please stay tuned for the rest of this video. Straightblacklove.com. Makes sense though, isn't it, right? This person is setting up the, the platform or setting up the uh, argument that Virgil Abloh doesn't want to hire black people. He's only selling himself white people because he's selling out his Uncle Tom. And then, you know, the person that's saying this, again, you have to put things into context. You can't get too upset with people how, with the point of view they have because, you know, she's then promoting or is backed by a, um, a dating uh, company that's specifically aimed at in promoting the idea of black love. 
log into straight black <laughs> that was interesting right <laughs> They had to stipulate like that, didn't they? <laughs> Come on, man. You always like it. <laughs> Some people are fucking nuts. <laughs> Honestly, imagine someone telling you how to run your company. Who you should hire. Imagine that being a thing. Imagine when you feel... I'm arguing it from that point, right? Imagine if somebody's telling a Virgil to do that. Somebody that purposely surrounds it is this. <laughs> Some people would argue, yeah. Some people, again, I don't argue, but some people could argue that Virgil's a clout chaser. Some people could say that, right, about Virgil. Let's say he latches onto kids and gets them in to kind of soak up their wave or gives them a platform so he can kind of, you know, get them on, get them under his wing so they can help his brand become bigger. Some people would argue that, right? If that was true, if that rumor was true, if people, if what people said about him was true in the comments, oh, he's he's kind of stealing kids' talents and stealing their wave and getting a monster that he can steal their thing. Cool. Let's say that's true. What do you think these kids are going to look like? Do you think he's going to be, you think he's going to, do you think if he's out there trying to get kids that are doing cool things on the internet to stand next to him so he can look cool, do you think he's going to be picky enough to say, I only want white boys doing this? He's not gosher, bruv. You know what I mean? We've got evidence on Gosha. We know what Gosha likes. This isn't a Gosha argument. This is somebody who's making cool stuff and is seeing cool kids out there wearing it. The kids who are, not, who are again, reminder, the kids who are actually going to wear the items, not fashion critics or people who write op-eds on, 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 on certain websites. The kids are actually going to buy the stuff. That's really important to them, to see him standing next to a John Ross, a Ian Connor, all these sort of kids. It's important. They want to see that. So do you think he's then going to go a step further and say, okay, I only want a certain colour, a certain race, certain background. It's like, come on, man, come on. Straight back, love. Get out of here, man. This lady. Okay, let's go back. Let's go. Let's start here. What's she saying? Be sure to go and support the online store as well as the physical store today. Virgil Abloh is from Rockford, Illinois, and he got his start in the fashion industry after he did a successful internship at Fendi in 2009 alongside Kanye West. In 2013, Black this inspired him to go on to launch his own fashion label named Off White. And in 2018, he was hired. When she's saying, a- when she's um, when she's saying the phrase Off White. You think she's saying it on purpose because she she thinks the phrase "off white" means he's trying to be white. Do you think so? Like that's he regards her as off white. Because I get I don't know I get a hint that she's really rubbing that in white. What? <laughs> so if you're so what? I wonder if if there's are there? Is, do you think some work black people go as far as doing the thing of like you know you can't even wear white clothes? Is that a thing? Or you can't listen to white music? Is that a thing? Do you think they go that far? If they do, that is wacko territory, man. That's like that's like as that's as bad as um Mexicans are coming over our wall to come and you know rape and kill our teenage girls and shit, right? That's that kind of level of fucking his hysteria. That is nuts. I, I, again, I'm not sure if that's the thing. I'm not sure if that's the case, but if if you can't even wear white jeans being a black dude in front of some woke black people or at an historically black college because you might get called out for being a puppet, whoosh. artistic director for their menswear line. Now, I personally heard of Virgil Abloh because obviously I watch a lot of tennis and I saw some of Serena's outfits and I noticed that on her outfits they always had these quotation marks. And when I researched further into that, I realized he was the one that was behind it, that was designing some of her outfits. And last year we had a bit of controversy alongside of Serena where so again, was the reason well, behind this match. So again, this is interesting, right? Um... Let me get that. So the interesting thing about this is that she's laid the platform, right? Okay, let me take this picture off of me on the screen. She's laid the platform quite well for essentially fighting his case, right? She's given him a background. He came up with Kanye, interning at Fendi, the front row pictures he posted, surrounded by people of color, you know, some friends, some not, adjacent friends, self-taught, runway, probably f- the runway picture that she posted, you know, those look, look, look at her front row. It, it looked completely different to her front row. You might see of Chloe, or Prada or whatever other company out there. Cool, no problem. But she doesn't credit him with that. Then she mentions that she watches a lot of tennis, right? And one of the you know one of the biggest tennis stars out there, Serena Williams. You know, outfits are designed by Virgil Abloh. Again, but still, he's not he's not he's not a, he's not an ally. And then on top of it, she does he designs the um, he helps creative direct the front cover of GQ with Serena Williams on the front of it wearing. 
again, maybe a couple of off-white pieces and a Chanel belt. I'm not sure if they were able to... They're not able to do that joining together, are they, really? Usually on most shoots, if you wear one brand, you have to wear the whole look. They won't let you wear it together. I'm not sure. But however, let's say, let's say he just he took the pictures and maybe he created direct to the, the front cover. He then crosses out the man, man of the year and puts woman of the year in quotation marks. All these things are would be points in the Virgil cap in the Virgil pocket, right? I'm like, look, look what I'm doing for black culture. Again, it's not it's not that kind of conversation. That's not something that I'd ever want to promote. But for somebody that has that kind of warped thinking, that should be that should hold him in good graces, shouldn't it? It should be like, oh yeah, look, you're doing some good stuff for us, right? But no. Because he because he crossed out men and put women in quotation marks, again, his kind of trademark, he's now what? He's now she's trying to say that he's questioning her um womanhood. Because supposedly there's a conversation in the US, I don't know where, I've not heard it myself, that supposedly uh, people say Serena Williams is like a man. She doesn't look like a woman. Uh, it's unfair or something like that, that, or that she's playing. I don't know, whatever conversation it may be that she's, inv- she's invented in her head. What I thought was funny or interesting or cool about the quotation mark with woman on it was that if you look to the news prior to it happening, I think even prior to her pregnancy, Serena's pregnancy, there was a conversation in tennis world I think with the dude that's always shouting and he made a comment, a quite a flippant comment that, you know, um, a number 2000 or 1200 seed would beat uh, the top 10, would be a top 10, 10 female tennis star easily, right? It's a completely different sport. You know, we had different power, different whatever. And I think Serena Williams quite graciously agreed with it, but also kind of poked some fun back at it, right? It was a kind of a back and forth thing happening in the tennis world. You know, and again, that's an argument for another another day, but that was a thing that was going on in tennis, right? A really prominent male tennis star said that, you know, women aren't as good as they think they are because, you know, anyone for anyone ranked 200 below could be the, the number 10 or number number one women's person easily with their hands tied behind their back. You know, and kind of Virgil kind of played on this sort of thing, crossing that man of the year and putting women. I thought that's quite cool, right? It's part of the thing he does. He's writing on the cover. They, they printed it that way too. It looks quite cool. But instead, look at how she interprets it magazine cover for GQ where it showed Serena in the magazine and she had on this leotard and on one side of the magazine they put in quotations woman. When I found out he was behind it I was like what black man in his right mind would even insinuate that knowing all the transgender allegations that are out here about Serena and how they're always trying to make black women the face of masculinity like I oh, wait, what should again absolutes these are just, they're always talking absolutes all of these allegations out there where are these allegations I've not seen them I've not seen his allegations. I've seen some commentary, again, mostly from work Twitter people trying to say that, you know, Serena's as good as the women, which, you know, is probably not true. Um, because you can, because again, it's sport, right? Sport isn't uh, uh, social sciences. You can, you can just, you can, social sciences. But anyway, with sport, you can basically, you can, you can, you can test it out, your hypothesis. You can get the 10 best women. You can get men ranked 200 and below, put them head to head three sets and see who wins most likely the guys will win right that's just uh, you can just prove it straight away but there's a lot of conversation about that mostly about oh, how good she is compared to women which compared to men which doesn't you know needs to happen she's a fucking legend in tennis regardless right you don't even need to compare it to men to say she's a legend in tennis not female tennis in tennis in general right but instead you want to again pick apart the argument attribute something to it that hasn't been attributed make up these absolute claims that everyone has to be aware of these allegations maybe i'm not aware of them maybe i don't have no idea that people think that she's trans i don't have no idea because i only see her again i don't watch tennis i only i'm assuming virgil probably doesn't watch sit there and watch his four matches of tennis he probably sees stuff online sees what she represents um catches something here and there and for the most part you're just like wow i can admire that person same thing with lebron james right i can just admire him from afar and say wow this guy's an amazing athlete when i dig deep a bit deeper so i find out oh that lakers fans don't like him now because they think that he went there for a cash grab he went there to maybe um, um solidify his hollywood partnerships and the fact that you know he's out injured lakers didn't make the playoffs he's got the shop thing when you dig deeper you find all these other things but if I'm making a collaboration or I'm making a TV show and I and I hire LeBron James and I'll suddenly get killed on Twitter because people are telling me I'm the one I'm the reason why they're teammate in the championships, I can't I can't take a brief responsible for that. I'm why why would I know all that subtext? Why would I know all that um ancillary information? I'm just talking to the person on a business level, on a creative expression level. That's what he basically is doing with the, with Serena. Now the, the the Michael Jackson thing is another issue. The Michael Jackson thing is probably somewhere is something that he should he should have probably taken more responsibility on Virgil that is and kind of educated himself on what was happening because again I, I'm maybe I'm a little bit more 
plugged into what's happening in terms of TV development di- um, land. But the rumblings of a, this documentary, Michael Jackson documentary coming out, that's going to really expose Michael Jackson, was around for ages, right? We found out that this documentary, I think it was debuted at Sundance. There was a standing ovation. People were crying. Some people walked out. We knew it was going to be a big deal, right? We were aware that this documentary was going to maybe um, further the narrative that Michael Jackson allegedly um, was molesting children, right? So it would have been in his interest to find that out or somebody within his team to be aware of, hey, we might need to put a lid on this, on this collection because it, there could be some a storm brewing. He didn't. And then, you know, whatever happened, happened. It got taken off the shelves. It's not in production anymore. Huge waste of time, money wasted. Cool. But with the Serena thing, like no one, I don't know anyone that knew about these transgender allegations. Did you? I know I didn't. Understand that you want to have some sort of shock value, but I just didn't think that, that was wise. So now, more recently, it has come out today that there was this controversial post that he made on Instagram where he was showing this photo of his staff for his great off white, and there was no black people whatsoever. Now, I'm sure some of y'all are gonna say, Oh, there's not a lot of black people in Italy, but how it works with a lot of these fashion designers and interns, etc., is that they pick them from around the world. You- what are you talking about, mate? Have you been, have you, do, do you know how much this lady doesn't know jack shit? Do you know how much an intern makes? Do you know if they even get paid? Do you think they're going to be flying out interns from fucking London, from Dawson, <laughs> from Brixton, black girls from Peckham to go and, and work in a Milan fashion house somewhere in the middle of Italy where you might need to speak the language? Do you honestly think that's going to happen? Do you think girls actually want to do it themselves? Really? For real? Again, it's just absolutes, right? These these sweeping conclusions about something that you have no idea about. There's a lot of nuance to these things. And again, it does a real disservice to the people that are on the screen. How, like, that's the thing I hate about wokeism, right? Or woke people for some reason, right? They, in order to kind of um, further their message, um, you know, in order to kind of further their agenda, it's at the detriment of somebody else, right? Now, these innocent young ladies who are just doing the best they can, working in a fashion company, trying to make ends meet, and are being dragged on online, right? Their names being tarnished. I'm sure there's some psychos out there that try to find who they are, trying to see if they're tagged, flood their comments with bullshit. That's what they're doing, right? And they only try and do their job. So in order to kind of prop up or further the conversation of diversity in the workplace, it's at the detriment of somebody else that's actually working in that position. Now they get fucked off. That's why I'm not a fan of affirmative action. Because some way or the other, it's just going to cause resentment. If you're saying, okay, we're going to commit to hiring five black people. It's like, what the fuck is that? Why don't you just open it up and say, we're going to commit to having an, the, uh, having having a platform where we allow five people from disenfranchised, maybe low socioeconomic backgrounds, maybe from an area in the country that specifically doesn't have a high number of people that are going on to further education. That might be pretty cool, right? You just look at the map, you think, okay, who, wh- which borough of London has the lowest uh, rate of people going to university? Okay, cool, boom, there. We're going to do an initiative where we are allowing kids from Newham, we're allowing five, we'll have five slots for kids from Newham to get into um, Oxford. You don't lower the entry requirements, you just allow them to take the test. That's all you do. Don't look, don't give them special disinvitation. You just say, we're going to allow five of you to take the test. If you get in, you get in. If you don't, those spaces roll over to next year. Instead of saying, we're going to hire five and we're going to bring down the entry requirements. Then what happens when that person comes into the class? They're not at the level of everyone else in the class. There's resentment there for the people that are in the class because that person's maybe holding them back. The person that's in the class coming from a different area or who already has weird you know, um, senses of self or how they look at themselves anyway in general. They're not the most self-confident person out there. That's why maybe they might act out in certain ways, then starts feeling even worse about themselves. It's just like, what is this, man? Everyone's suffering. You don't just have to pick a fashion designer or whatever staff member that is directly from Italy. Just like he's from Rockford, Illinois. What is guy sure what, what you talking about? All over the freaking world. They get these people's planes paid. So you're telling me, right, if there's a Starbucks in a predominantly white area and they've only got white staff there, would they have to fly in people from different backgrounds in order to make you happy? Really? It was like, I remember one fan, I think in a Game of Thrones press junket or one of those kind of Q&A things, they asked George R. R. George R. R. Martin about, I forgot what thing it was, something about the extras not being black or something. And I think he mentioned like, you know, yeah, we filmed it, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of Spain, somewhere in Ireland, somewhere in Croatia. We just put out an open casting call for extras and whoever turned up got the job. 
there were, it was like where we were happened to be places where there were predominantly loads of white people there. So what is he meant to do? Fly extras in from our places of the world to go and do it? No, extras already get paid the lowest. They're already the lowest rung. They're, they're already the they're already the lowest paid on the ladder of people that get paid anyway. Like <sighs> before, and they ship them out. But in this case, it's like he specifically hired whites to work beside, and here's why: he has a white wife. He and his wife have two children. This way it gets a little bit nasty and I'm not going to really play all of this, but she gets, she starts talking about a family, not being an ally. He has a white wife. It's like, you know, it's a bit disgusting after this, but in general, you know, um, she goes on and on and on basically bashing Virgil saying he's not an ally. And it's just, again, it's just, it's bizarre land because for me, I think actions speak louder than words. He's given loads of opportunity to those people who are, you know, who look like him. He didn't have to do that. I think in this day and age where most people are very um, closed and don't really reveal or pass down or pass back the ladder so I'll be able to get up with, right? There's that famine thinking, the whole Jay-Z crabs in a barrel freestyle from the um, um, from the B-Sides concert comes to mind. Most people don't do that, right? Most people got, it's like, what, what, it's, why, it's why people make such a big deal about people like Rick Ross people like DJ Khaled and stuff, right? People make a big deal about something like that because Khaled, for the most part, shouts out every producer who co-produces his track, right? He shouts them out. He gives them credits on albums. Rick Ross is probably the the archetype of a good artist label boss, right? He's always promoting his artist's music without them asking. He, uh, he, he comes on video shoots. He gives them verses. He advises on business ideas. He's ever-present. He stands next to them all the time, which is really important in hip-hop. So no one, people make a big deal out of those kind of people because for the most part, people don't do that, right? They look after their own self-interest. Maybe it's the way we're wired. Maybe it's because the fact that, you know, when you get to that position, the the adulation and hype gets your head and you, you know, get a bit dizzy and all of a sudden, you know, everyone around you doesn't really make any sense. But for the most part, I should speak louder than words. Virgil's consistently, consistently for his entire career, surrounded himself with people better than him, right? People that he could kind of lift up, learn from, get better than, uh, meet at that level, wherever maybe he's always surrounded himself with great talented people and shout them out. His Instagram stories is littered with people that he's met along his journey, collaborators, friends, people he's working on projects with. And guess what? They're all tagged. In Instagram social media world where you care about those kind of things, that's really important. He's tagging you in the things that you do. He's reaching out directly via direct message for you to come and shoot his um um I don't know, to kind of shoot the behind the scenes footage for his lookbook. He's flying you out to just sit, just hang around and catch a vibe when he's designing his design studio. Like loads of things that people don't have to do. He's doing it all the time, consistently. And the fact that maybe he might have one place, one area in his life where it might not be to your liking is the issue. Like, come on. And again, it goes back to the idea of like, if you don't like what he's doing, guess what? Do it yourself. Launch your own clothing company. Hire only people from a certain background further that conversation and then you know do that that way and then maybe you might set an example or maybe not maybe that's your role to play maybe his role is different it just it just seems really weird that people get the have the the cheek or the guts or the nerve to tell somebody else how they should do life like it's like what the fuck are you to tell me how to do anything it's my life i'll do it i'll do it as i please bizarre bizarre but anyway what do i know um, I think that might be a good place to end. Should it be a good place to end or should we continue? But yeah, that video was weird, man. That lady is just like, I don't know, man. She's on some mad. And then he starts talking about people's wives and family and shit. It's like, eesh, eesh, eesh. Chill out, love. Chill out. Um, what else do we have here? Um, oh, yeah. As for Satanic Mills, I think, speak to that because I mentioned, I think that was a Danny Baker stuff, right? So this is a story that shouldn't really be that surprising, but, you know. People get surprised about the weirdest things these days. But there's this story here from BBC News. Uh, JD Sports and Asos Warehouse like dark satanic mills, right? And I was like, no way. You're telling me the place that can get you an item to you in within an within a few hours doesn't have good working conditions? <gasps> no way. So like, what? Come on, man. What do you expect, man? It's like when some... You know, some people try... There was a little... There's a lot of fake outrage that stopped really quickly when people started... When people... Um, heard the stories of how dark and horrible it is to work at a you know a Amazon warehouse facility, right? And then they started to realize, hold on, I quite like this prime thing. I'm not going to protest too much, right? Because they knew, like, what do you expect? Like, you know, there are some companies now who are trying to push as far as they can to see if they are able to get items to particular people within a particular area within an hour, right? 
Like that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to go that far. If they're trying to get you an item within an hour, you would you order a charger from Amazon, it comes to you in an hour's time. That's how far they're trying. What do you think is going to happen? You think they're going to have great working conditions? You think the people that are doing that job are going to be, you know, working in Google on beanbags, you know, playing hacky sack and shit? No, it's going to be fucking dark. But again, means to an end, isn't it? But let's see. But the article says, JD Sports assets have been accused of running their warehouses like satanic mills after figures show the number of ambulances call out to their sites. Ambulances were dispatched 40 times to JD Sports troubled Rochester site last year while there were 45 call outs to the assets warehouse in Grimfall. <laughs> see all those girls I just think of, of I just think of all those basic girls in where in fucking offices all across London right giggling and gaggling like geese when another white and black fucking package from ASOS comes in of another shitty dress that you're gonna wear once or twice that to a fucking shitty work um function uh, that you're gonna get messed up after a couple of times because you know it doesn't f- look the way it does to on the model or on the website and then you're gonna bin I just think of all those kind of girls, right? Who kind of, you know, some of them might have, some of them um, might count themselves as vegan, right? Some of them are, might be socially aware, might be aware of the environment, hearing this sort of news and uh, pure torment that must be running through their head, right? Like, here's where I stand morally, and here's the where the company that I support, the company that gives me the ability to wear frilly, uh, sparkly dresses during New Year's Eve. This is what they do. <sighs> what do I do? What do I do? I can just imagine the torment going through the head. It makes you laugh so much. <laughs> oh, <laughs> satanic meals. Union Union United said the figures reignited concerns about working conditions. Again, I'm just. I don't know. Working conditions do need to be improved, but there must be an there must be some um, level of understanding of what you're getting yourself into when you decide to work for a company that offers people the ability to get an item sent to them next day. Like you're gonna be suffering if you're if you, especially you're not the one working in the head office, you're not making the graphics about hey, hold it now within the next four hours you're gonna get an item in t- four hours. If that's not you, you are. If you're the one actually handing those, putting those items through and shit, bagging them up. Uh, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. I'll tell you that now from the outside. Both employers emphasized the importance of that they place on health and safety. But I remember, I imagine how much um, it's like um, it's like saying they're going to try and improve the working conditions of call centers. Why would you do that? We know what a call center is. We know how much of a nuisance it is. It's a means to an end for some people. They're, I think call centers have maybe the lowest um, retention rate of any workplace, I, I'd assume, for the most part. Maybe second only to the restaurant industry. Maybe second only to the retail industry. Like, you know what it is, right? You go there for a reason. You go there because you want to make some money. Um, the entry requirements aren't that high. It's, it's a means to an end, isn't it? Um, the figures based on freedom information requests show that ambulances were called out Rochdale 170 times over the past three years and 148 times to the Assos site in South Yorkshire. Um, the sports chain headed by Peter Cargill was forced to start an investigation into conditions in Rochdale after an undercover film showed staff allegedly paid less than the minimum wage and treated like cattle. Again, not surprised. Um, re- re- responding to figures, Matt Depp of Unite said the warehouses and some companies risk becoming the clock, the dark satanic mills of 21st century. But again, they shouldn't be being paid less than minimum wage. But if they don't take that, someone else will gladly take that because it's probably much better than working in a car wash factory place right one of my mates used to work there full time you've got like 400 pound a month working there day in day out full time 400 pound a month so imagine that guy if someone says oh you're only going to get 900 quid a month 1000 a month for doing for 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 packing uh sequin dresses into little plastic bags come here give me that job right now man Do you know what i mean like they they would they wouldn't care literally wouldn't care they're making millions while their workers are literally being taken away from ambulances. Again, you can't you can't equate the fact that Jeff Bezos is a billionaire and the fact that people are making minimum wage working in a warehouse, you know? He's providing jobs. Like, let's relax. Um, the figures do not detail why the ambulances were called out, but previous instances of poor work condition practice in warehouse include staff subject to time toilet breaks, which is nuts, but again, makes sense. Uh, invasive celebrity checks, security checks again, Makes sense and exhausting targets again. Makes sense. Those do, those are all those are all important factors that are going to lead to your company being more successful, targets being met, and ultimately you being paid. They all factor into it. You take too long in the toilet, that's going to affect the, the amount of packages that go out. That's going to affect the you know the overall order frequency and whatever it may be. Maybe reviews on trust balance, all that kind of malarkey. It's all. I'm not surprised. Among other retailers included. Um, 
21 ambulances were called out to Amazon Warehouse in Warrington and six to its Doncaster site. The figures show that Sports Direct's ambulances call-out rate had improved since the scandal around the practice of its Shrewsbury site. Respond to figures, both J Sports said, given the scale of its operations, the number of instances in which the ambulances were called out, again, that's just true, proportionally low. Given this, exactly. If there's only 20, what? If there's only 41, mm-mm-mm. Yeah, it's quite good actually if you think about it. I mean, that's, that's a good point. I never thought about it. If it's only 40 instances of ambulance being called JD Sports in one site and they've got many sites across the UK selling, you know, black and blue, black and navy blue track suits and black and white Air Force Ones, it's pretty good rate. They've kept it quite low. But again, I just think working in those kind of places, you should know what you're getting yourself into. It should be no surprise that a company that offers a, comp- a customer's the ability to get things in 24 hour turnaround is going to maybe work you to the bone. It should, it should be standard. It should be standard procedure, really. I think, in my opinion. Um, but hey, what the fuck do I know? Uh, I think that might be it, you know. Yeah, that might be it. End it there. Thank you so much for tuning in to Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 192. I've been your host, Agassino Zinger. For more things regarding myself, um, whether it's DJ gigs, blog, DJ mixes, all that malarkey, check out my website. Link below in the show description, agassinozinger.com. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. We'll get back to you. Not one of these fake YouTubers that doesn't reply back. I do reply back. If you listen via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. That'll go a long way to making sure people find the show. But until then, until then, ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care.